as pharaoh, Aha wielded absolute power. The Abydos excavation reveals evidence of human sacrifice. The skeletons of 35 healthy adults, most under the age of 20, all part of a mass burial. Even at that remote time, that is not a natural age of death. And so we may conclude they were killed to follow the king in his afterlife, to serve him there in eternity. The pharaoh and his worldly goods are buried at one end of the complex, followed by the 35 victims of human sacrifice in smaller tombs. And in the last tomb are even more bones. But these are not human. For identification, they were compared with modern skeletons. By sifting, we found a lot of animal bones especially bones of lions. That was quite a surprise. Several lions died and were buried at the same time as the young adults, evidence that they too were sacrificed. But why were these lions entombed along with the pharaoh? The king identifies himself with the lion to show his power, to express his power. Dreyer's excavations reveal that Egypt's first pharaohs wielded enormous power, enough to command the ritual slaughter of dozens of people. And the lion sacrifices provide the first clue to the meaning of the Sphinx's form. Lions symbolize the power of the pharaoh. But the Sphinx is more than just a lion. It's also part human. Ancient Egyptians depict their gods as part animal, part human. But usually those gods have animal heads and human bodies. The Sphinx is just the opposite. When you put the human head on the lion body, you have all the strength and power of the lion. And you have the human head, which is a symbol of intelligence and control. And so it is an image of power under control. But whose power and control? The human head is actually wearing a scarf called the Nemes. It's a headdress. And only the pharaohs wore the Nemes headdress. So the Sphinx is both a god and a pharaoh. And when it came to symbolizing the power of the pharaoh, the bigger, the better. Over the next 500 years, the pharaoh's tombs got more and more massive. From underground burial chambers to above ground tombs and from stepped pyramids to the Great Pyramids of Giza. But while the form and size of royal tombs evolved slowly, the Great Sphinx has no precedent. It was the first time in the history of Egypt that they created sculpture at this scale. So how was the Sphinx created? Looking at its paws, it appears to be built with thousands of blocks. Was it constructed like the pyramids, by stacking blocks of stone? But a closer look reveals that its upper body and head are carved out of one huge rock. Does that mean it was carved like Mount Rushmore? Clues lie in the stone of the Sphinx and the rock around it. Amazingly, nobody had ever investigated its stones in any detail. Until Mark Lehner, 30 years ago. Today, he's one of the world's leading Egyptologists. When I first came to Egypt, the best maps that existed of the Sphinx were simply the outline. 
If you're investigating how the Sphinx was built, the existing drawings were about as useful as if you were trying to build a 50-story skyscraper using just a satellite snapshot of its roof. That's how little was known about the Sphinx. To unlock its secrets, someone needed to take a much closer look. So I spent five years here mapping every stone to scale. This was my office, and I would take my breaks here and have a stale cheese sandwich and a cup of Nescafe. Lehner's mapping gave him an intimate knowledge of the Sphinx, its stone, and the Giza Plateau. To begin with, the Sphinx is made of limestone. Close inspection of the limestone reveals how it was formed. You see a pattern that looks kind of like a brain coral, or almost like a sponge. All the limestone at Giza, including the body of the Sphinx, was once the floor of a sea. It was a seabed. So you have frozen into the stone various elements of seafloor life. Millions of years ago, the Giza Plateau was underwater. Sea creatures and plants died, falling to the bottom. Over time, their remains were compressed to form limestone. But not all limestone is created equal. Some limestone is formed from the soft sea bottom and some from hard coral reefs. Together, they form a kind of layer cake of hard and soft limestone. The Sphinx is composed out of several different limestone layers. So it's as though you carved the Sphinx out of a, a layer cake. And there are gooey layers of soft frosting. And then there are intervening harder layers. The harder layers of rock have held up better than the softer layers. Today, it looks a lot different from when it was first built. Its original smooth surface has been eaten away by over 4,000 years of wind, water, and sand. Here on the right side of the Sphinx chest, we can see how weathering has put the softer layers into deep recesses while the harder layers protrude. To Lehner, this weathering pattern is another important clue as to how the Sphinx was built. Recent restorations obscure this pattern. But photographs from the 1920s clearly show it. On both the body of the Sphinx and on the side of what is known as the Sphinx Ditch. The pattern acts like a fingerprint. And when Lehner compares the Sphinx's body with the side of the Sphinx Ditch, it's a perfect match. We are certain that these are the same layers of natural rock that form the south side of the Sphinx Ditch. Lehner identifies more of that rock directly in front of the Sphinx's paws in the ruins of a building known as the Sphinx Temple. There, on the huge stone blocks that were once the walls of the Sphinx Temple, he discovers those same familiar on the Sphinx. Because you can see that the layers runs continuously from one block to another through many of the blocks forming the temple walls. Here is one geological layer. Then this yellow band is a softer geological layer. But what does the similarity of the rock in the Sphinx, ditch, and temple tell Lehner about how the Sphinx was built. The Egyptians quarried a horseshoe-shaped ditch, leaving a core that left a big block from which they carved the Sphinx itself. They moved the stone, sometimes in blocks of 100 tons, down to the lower terrace for fabricating the walls of the Sphinx temple. <laughs> 